Uh, our speaker tonight is Gary Venkataramanan. Uh, Gary received his bachelor's degree in electrical engineering from the Government College of Technology, Coimbatore, India, in 1986. He received his master's from the California Institute of Technology in Pasadena in 1987, and his PhD from UW-Madison in 1992. After teaching at Monta Montana State University in Bozeman, Gary returned to UW-Madison as a faculty member in 1999. Uh, Gary is a senior member of IEEE. Uh, Gary performs research in various areas of electronic power conversion. And he is a professor in the UW Electrical and, Elect and Computer Engineering Department, and also serves as the director of the Wisconsin Electric Machines and Power Electronics Consortium, WEMPEC. Tonight, Gary will tell us about WEMPEC and its mission capabilities and research. Members of the audience are invited to post questions in chat. After the presentation, Gary will answer those questions followed by questions asked live. So now take it away, Gary. So thank you so much for inviting me to make this presentation. Um, so before I open my PowerPoint presentation, I want to again thank all of you for inviting me to, uh, to make this presentation. Also, be available, uh, taking time away from your dinner or whatnot, or having dinner and simultaneously listening to me uh, uh, talk about uh, WEMPEC. I'm really happy to participate in this. Uh, these sort of, uh, in IEEE, as you all know, has two pathways the technical activities and the regional activities. And among in the regional activities, I used to be very active uh, while I was in Montana, like Chuck mentioned, uh, I started as a treasurer, secretary and vice chair, and I, I would say retired as a chair after five years during that period I, I was there. And, and it's a sort of different flavor of interactions with uh, people. So I'm really glad to participate in this regional activity, particularly people over here in Madison and also in the Green Bay area uh, locally. And I see some people uh, from, uh, from other parts of Wisconsin, as well as uh, Milwaukee uh, sign in. So I'm really glad to be able to talk to all of you. Thanks to all these advances in electrical engineering, I can make this, uh, do this lecture from my office here and reach uh, to all of you, go electrical engineering. Uh, so let me just uh, share my screen. Like Chuck mentioned, if you have any questions, please feel free to post it in the chat and I'll try to answer to the best uh, extent possible after my presentation. And uh, so I still need to get uh, permission to share. Chuck, if you can make me a co-host. Okay. Yeah, I guess making you co-host would do that. Does that give you permission? Yes, I got permission now. There you go. Okay, so there is my PowerPoint presentation and I will change to presentation mode. So the title of my presentation is uh, WEMPEC, Wisconsin Idea in Action. And I will talk uh, briefly about Wisconsin IDEA just uh, to set the frame for what WEMPEC is and how we uh, serve the people of Wisconsin and also the students here and also the power electronics and electrical machines community at large and play a role uh, uh, from the UW-Madison in this uh, discipline. And um, so the, one of the expressions of Wisconsin idea is that the idealistic and humane concern that knowledge could and should have practical impacts and the needs and the problems and the aspirations of people. 
And uh, this was articulated by President Van Hise uh, more than 100 years ago. And those of you who are um, uh, long-term residents of Wisconsin and people who have participated in uh, activities at UW-Madison may have heard what Wisconsin idea is. And a little over 100 years ago, it sort of permeated um, sort of uh, how Wisconsin developed and the impact of University of Wisconsin-Madison in, uh, in the economic development of the state, be it dairy industry or agriculture or extension activities or engineering companies. Uh, there's always been a, a constant uh, give and take between the companies and the businesses and the people of Wisconsin and the University of Wisconsin. And that serves as a, I would say a charter for all of us as faculty members at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison in carrying out our duties on behalf of the state. And that's what I wanna discuss about how WEMPIC is an exemplary uh, uh, operation and, a, and a, a model for expression of Wisconsin idea today uh, that is alive. It's not a theoretical construct, but it is a practical aspect of our, of our lives here as faculty members and students on campus. And uh, so I'm gonna scale back. I wanna talk a little bit about education and um, that frames how our consortium operates and the role of Wisconsin IDEA uh, in this picture uh, and uh, in the business of uh, serving our students as educators. Uh, we go back to how can we educate our students best? And uh, there's a lot of literature on how to teach well, how the students learn well, and how we express our educational aspirations to the community. And uh, this long history of scholarship among educators nationwide, worldwide in this field. And I'm gonna talk about two or three aspects here. Uh, one of us, it is attributed to a person named Edgar Dale. And uh, he was very influential in the education of our uh, community in this nation uh, in the 1930s and 40s uh, era. And he came up with this idea of uh, what we call cone of learning. And I'm trying to describe that in the form of a, uh, of a pyramid or a triangle. And on the bottom of it, we see direct purposeful experiences that people um, uh, experience every day as part of their life. And uh, Edgar Dale's uh, idea was that that is when, when people engage in direct purposeful experiences, the learning is the highest there. And then when we come to classroom education where, or reading or somebody telling you how to do something or what to do something, it is the most ineffective way of learning something. And this has been part of our uh, educational philosophy in this country for a very long time. And in between these verbal symbols, like writing on a blackboard, people looking at it and trying to capture what is being delivered to them versus engaging in direct purposeful experience, like I'm going from my office to my uh, work for my um, home, the pathway I take to go there and mapping on the experience there, I know how to go there through an experience that gets embedded in my brain that nobody needs to teach me how to do that. So it's a part of experience that, um, uh, that I learned that and it stays with me. And that is what uh, Edgar Dale calls the most effective. And there is a range of continuum of other things in between the two visual symbols, radio recordings, still pictures, motion pictures, television. I think that is where our today's YouTube and TikTok and all those things fall under that category. And then we have exhibitions, field trips, demonstrations, all of these going from red towards green, the effectiveness of what we do gets better and better 
when we were able to engage that way. So, and then we come to something a little bit, let's say more controversial. It says authentic learning takes place when a motivated student is helping a person who's putting their knowledge to use. This is somebody um, named Christopher Alexander. He's an architect, philosopher uh, from University of California, Berkeley. He's still alive, but he did a lot of work on community development and uh, education and schools and how to teach and things like that. And he expressed this. And what that says is that what we think about apprenticeship, when a journeyman goes with a, a person who, who's experienced in that, there is a very, very deep learning that takes place and apprentice learns from there. That is an example of uh, what this is being expressed there. And then John Dewey is a very famous character or personality in the field of education. He says, education is about the making of a world and it's not sitting in a classroom and taking notes and doing homework. How do we construct the world that we live in? That's where education takes place. And that forms the backdrop of how I would say WEMPEC operates and how we impart education and serve the people of the state. Um, then I'm going to talk about, um, there's a lot of theory of education. So when we talk about Edgar Dale and John Dewey, they are sort of, I would say, philosophers and learners who, teachers who came up with expressing that from a very, very high level. And then the people who are educators and people who are in the school of education, they classify forms of education and there are various categories that they talk about behaviorist education, objectivist education, constructivist education, uh, cognitive education, things like that. And they do a research on how people learn effectiveness on that. So the objectivist education is what we today practice in many of the classroom settings. The teachers and the instructors will come up with the instructional objectives for each lesson. At the end of this lecture, I expect the students to learn, for instance, how to design an amplifier or how to draw the graph between frequency response of a system. So very, very clearly act, uh, active, uh, articulated objectives. And then there are measurable learning outcomes. We can give an examination to a student and say whether they have successfully picked up that objective or not. And the target skills are classified. There's an entire taxonomy of it uh, that has to do with skills are classified into evaluation skills, synthesis skills, design skills. And um, so various uh, classifications of how knowledge is uh, represented. And then there are instructional strategies, giving homework, drilling the students, giving all of that is part of that. And then the professors and the teachers provide learning support by giving reading material, giving them homework and exercises to do that. And then there is an assessment problem, a process through homework and examinations. They say, whether the outcomes are realized or not, and then say, yeah, the student has passed the exam. And then we assume that the skills have been transferred to the student and they get the degree and go away. This is how most 99% of our education takes place today, K through 12, as well as in higher education. Now, an alternative, another different school of thought is what we call constructivist education, where there's a lot of discussion about people learning together from each other, not necessarily from a teacher, but also from other people. And then the learning context is very highly motivated. I want to build an electric car. I want to build a wind turbine. I want to build a, a mobile application for my a mobile phone. So there is an active engagement of the students participating in a process where they have a very, very high level of motivation to do something purposeful. 
And it includes a lot of language elements, the vocabulary that's connected with that. If you think about electric machines or a, a power electronic space, we have a vocabulary of switches, um, magnetic fields, and how we represent that. There's a language and a vocabulary and how we express things that are connected in there. And inside the student's mind, the learner's mind, there is an expression, there's a model that's being developed in their mind using the language that's being developed and using the process that they engage in. And there is always a prerequisite language elements that is that is necessary for that. You have a foundation and you build up on that slowly bit by bit. And the process is learning to learn, not necessarily learning and you're done because the process is continuing beyond uh, getting the skills through the experience. And the time taken to learn is very expressively or very explicitly understood that you cannot learn that by doing a weekend or a semester long course. So it is a continuum process. The student continues to learn beyond the classroom exercise by engaging in purposeful activity. And I would say that in a community of practice, this is another jargon again, a group of people working together to, with a purposeful uh, uh, um, uh, goal is what a community of practice is and learning is situated in that community. And WAMPEC is such a community of practice where we have a shared, a more shared value among the participants of WAMPEC. We have certain beliefs on how we ought to do things the way of doing things. There is a context for learning, the practice of electrical engineering from a discipline of power electronics and electric machines. And we have a social network of not only students, we have a social network of alumni, of uh, our, our sponsoring companies and the stakeholders there. We are a network, we're in constant interactions. And we have rituals, weekly seminars. We talk to each other, we come together annually uh, for a review meeting during which demonstration takes place. And with this COVID and all these uh, distance forms of interactions, we have adapted some of these, but we have our own rituals. And it's very interactive, students interacting with uh, sponsors, uh, Olympic sponsors, you'll know what they are at the end of my discussion here, presentation here. Faculty interact with sponsors and sponsors interacting with students and faculty interacting with students and staff, all of that is there's an interactive mechanism. It's a give and take, that's a reciprocal approach in which we do that. Then we have tools and artifacts, publications, things that we build, things that we carry around, um, that we walk around with. Right now here is an example of a little motor drive. So we carry around these artifacts that our students build starting from freshman all the way that are repositories of our knowledge. And then there is a long history WAMPEC's organizational history is about a little over 40 years old. We talk about that history and today's event is something like that, talking about the history that transmit that information to the next generation in a broader context of people. And there is a renewable, renewal of new people coming in, come and learning from the people who have participated in this and taking it beyond that. And we sustain this membership and grow that. And all of this is part of that community of practice that WAMPEC is one of it that expresses the Wisconsin idea to make learning more effective. That is the ultimate goal we're thinking about. So I would say this is sort of a motivation and of an introduction to my presentation talking about uh, Wempec. So let me talk about us. What is Wempec? Who are we? It was founded in 1981 by the two people that you're seeing in this picture. Uh, the person that's sitting up uh, is uh, Professor Don Novotny, 
Uh, he's still with us uh, in uh, living in Madison. And uh, Professor Tom Lippo, oh, he passed away uh, a little over a year ago. And they uh, together, uh, along with the, some of the industry leaders in Wisconsin, founded WEMPEC as a consortium, a consortium as we know it at UW-Madison. This is one of the moments where they went uh, fishing or hiking or some sort of a uh, outdoor activity that uh, Wisconsinites like and uh, came together. Uh, in the beginning of uh, sometime in the 80s, I would say, or it may have been dated before that. So they came together with a very specific goal in mind. And what were they thinking? You may think about, okay, tongue in cheek there. What were they thinking literally as well as uh, figuratively, what were they thinking? So they formulated goals to WEMPEC, and I copied this from a document from the 1980s that articulate these goals. It says sponsors and faculty directors of the program, they will work together, they will dedicate to the development of the best possible education, research, and service program in the area of electrical machines and power electronics. And they had specific program goals that they put together. One is very strong undergraduate elective program, graduating 30 to 20 to 30 BS recipients per year. 20 to 30 students will specialize, take electives in the area of power electronics and electric machines. This is what they put together in 1980. Most people at that time don't even know what power electronics is because the field itself was just emerging. And some of you participated in this audience in the innovation and invention of that field. Then they said, we'll have a strong MS and PhD program with 10 to 12 MS students and three to six PhD students that they're engaged in research in the field of electric machines, power electronics and AC drives. This is what they put forth. And then improved instructional and laboratory facilities for engaging in this research and education. And the very close productive relationship between faculty members like us and people who are at the sponsoring companies, particularly practicing engineers, learn what are their problems on a day-to-day -day basis. How can we educate our students better in the best possible approach? In our mind, this is the constructivist approach, not chalk and talk, but actually doing the work under supervision as we learn how to do it. And we do not teach without knowing, without doing what we're teaching. That is something that is sort of ingrained in the faculty fabric, DNA of WEMPEC. We do not teach from a textbook. We teach from experiences of something that we engage in on a day-to-day -day basis, on a month-to-bus basis, on an annual basis. None of our faculty use a textbook for our teaching because it is constantly evolving as our field is evolving. And that is something that is a mark of our education. So we're doing the power electronics and electric machines and electric drives, and we're teaching our students and our teachers are, our students are actually helping do the work in that process that they're learning, we're innovating constantly. That's what's happening here uh, in our program. So where are we today? I'm fast forwarding from 1981 to, to the 2021, 40 years ahead of time. So today we have four faculty members that are active full time on our campus from what used to be two, 40 years ago. In addition, we have three emeritus faculty members also retired from our program we have two faculty members that are late faculty members that have contributed and moved on to the next world or the, the, the heavenly world. So totally we have a throughput of about almost reaching about 10 people in this enterprise that began with two people. Right now we have three staff members on our campus 
two or three or four or five fast staff members have worked with us and retired and moved on. At the moment, we have 22 PhD students on our campus. We have 11 MS research students, we have 23 MS professional students. So we can see from the goals of it, we have exceeded the goals and done a lot better than what they put forth in mind. And cumulatively, we have our faculty together have graduated about 425 MS graduates in this area that work in electric machines and power electronics around the world. Um, quite a bit in a large number in Wisconsin, in the Midwest, in Detroit, in Michigan, in Illinois, in Ohio, in Minnesota, and then obviously on the coasts as well and in the South. 160 PhD students. Uh, who have graduated, who are engineers in various companies around the world and in the country. And we have visiting scholars. These are people who come here for six months or one year or three months to learn how we do WEMPEC, to take back to their universities, wherever they come from. Some of them come from companies, some of them come from universities, some of them are students, some of them are university professors, some of them are researchers, some of them are managers. They come and see how we do things so that they can repeat this in other places. And they have done so successfully at least in a half a dozen places around the, around the world. Today we have 60, more than 60 corporate sponsors, approximately 70 right now, it continues to grow fluctuate up and down. What began with three or four Wisconsin companies, now we have about 60 companies globally that are sponsors. What are sponsors? What do they do? Here are some images of what our students do, and I'll tell you more about what sponsors bring to us as well. So the program overview, we are an industry academia consortium. It means we do cutting edge research and we engage, we're engaged in education. That is our ultimate business. We encourage technology transfer through education to our students, as well as our students working in companies and through internships, through distance education programs, educating current and future engineers is our ultimate mission. We do that through doing research and doing tech transfer. The sponsoring companies give us a gift every year. They give us $17,500 per year today. It used to be, I think when they started WEMPEC, it used to be 2,500. Over 40 years, we're about five times more. And, uh, and then, so we have 60 companies that give us this money every year. This money is used not for our salary, our salary comes from the state of Wisconsin. We use this to support the students to study power electronics and electric machines, conduct research. We use that to support our administrative staff and lab staff for putting lab facilities and test facilities that we're not able to do using state resources. Our labs are the best in class anywhere in the world because we have a cumulative accumulation of things that we've built and kept up to date over the uh, 40 years. The WEMPIC funding sources represents one third of our budget. One third of our other budget comes from sponsored projects for specific industries, a company like Ford Motors or Rockwell Automation or Collins Radio company might come to us and say, we want to do a research project. We will do project work for that company that is defined with deliverables and budgets. We also get government grants. So the red portion is what we get for gift from the sponsor. That is our operating baseline revenue, but it's leveraged twice as much three times as much from industry, specific industry support from specific companies, as well as government contracts. The red portion alone cumulatively over the 30 years represents about, we've spent about $20 million hard cash 
on supporting our students, supporting our labs and the facilities. And you can start leveraging that. About $60 million has been spent over the last 40 years through industry research, government research, and, and uh, money coming in from that, other than the salary we get from the state of Wisconsin. And that is the impact Lampec has had in developing this discipline further. And the faculty as we stand today, myself on the left, I serve as the director for WEMPEC, but with me, we have three other faculty members, Professor Bulent, Professor Dan, Professor Eric, we all go first name basis. And uh, we have a director for technology and collaboration. We, we have sort of our own specific areas of interest. We're all very different people. We come from different parts. We have come from different educational backgrounds. We come from different disciplinary interests. We're very, very, I would say, rivaling and cooperating and competing with each other in what we do. But we work together. We don't fight with each other ever. We're always arguing with each other on how to do things and what we do, but we're together. And this is a unique feature. I would, you will not find it anywhere in the world on our campus or in any campus faculty coming together. We meet almost every week talking about how to develop our processes, educate our students better. We're always on the top of it. And we have, we can't do that with the, without a staff. Kyle Hansen, Kathy Young, and Pia Trump. These are our staff members today. And we'll be adding, and we have numerous amount of students on the top of these, and also student staff that help in what we do. So coming back to our students, what are we proud of? We're mostly proud of our students, the quality of our students. Uh, our students receive a solid grounding in theory and hands-on laboratory practices. You see the pictures, I mean, these are eye candy shots, but our students are doing this every day. In addition to listening to me talk about it on the chart and doing homework and putting it to practice. And that makes them very, very, I would say critical. When we're teaching something, I'm talking about some BS, they'll come back to me and say, that doesn't work. Why doesn't that work? We come back and do research on it. It's a very collaborative environment, a sense of community. Students from all faculty members work together in a shared space with shared equipment. All of it is shared uh, every day. They would sit together in their offices, work together. This is our list of sponsors. We couldn't do what we're doing without our sponsors. Let me uh, check my uh, time here. Okay, so I'm doing well, okay on time. Now, uh, here's our list of sponsors. Obviously, um, it keeps growing. One or two sponsors drop out every year. Two or three sponsors add every year. We've been averaging between 70, around 70 for the last four or five years or so. And they range software manufacturers, software vendors, Wisconsin companies, international companies, multinationals, and um, um, very small startup companies. We are a range of companies. Uh, all, they're all equal. We don't listen to one and not listen to the other. Each of them gives us 70,500 per year for us to support our students. And they're free to drop out any, any time, every, any year, if they decide not to renew their sponsorship. Um, companies have ups and downs. Engineers have ups and downs. They change companies, uh, their interest changes, but others catch up because we're working at, all of these companies know that when they come and get our students, they know what they're getting in terms of our students' quality is the highest uh, across the board. Uh, you know, you talk to any of these companies that hire people uh, working in electric machines, power electronics, AC drives in that space, 
our students can um, work on day one on their jobs. Um, networking companies are a good access to our students. They come and give seminars uh, every week during the school year, introduce their company, connect to our students. They come to campus every year, annual review meeting in May. It has a attendance two to 300 people every year. That is a meeting only for our members, uh, sponsor companies and their representatives. And we help them give recruiting assistance for our students to try to match them. Uh, we get uh, the companies get who is graduating at what time and what are their profiles. They can get access to that from their website. We post all our job postings to the Olympic sponsor job board. That's available not only for students, but others as well. And we have access to faculty. Uh, you can call us a phone and talk to us, send us an email. We'll be able to talk to you with NDAs or without NDAs uh, to the level of uh, confidence that you're comfortable with, your engineers are comfortable with. We have frequent opportunities for collaboration on problems you're trying to solve, some things that you want to solve within a week, things that are long-term, one or two year research projects or road mapping and things that you'd like to do we are uh, available to do things like that with our sponsors. Obviously, we do research. We support cutting edge research, uh, research in electric machines. That's sort of our, it has to have a spinning shaft typically along with the controller for that. And uh, we have a publication database over 2000 technical reports, thesis and other things. All our sponsors get access to downloading that from their website that is password protected. It's not available for other people. And many of these theses, you can go back to 1982, 1988 and find out what happened at that time. And uh, um, we're constantly looking, what, looking at what took place so much time ago as we innovate the future. And um, so we're engaged in research. This is an example of a poster from one of our students uh, presented during our review meeting. Our students prepare posters and lab demonstrations during our review meeting. Our annual review meeting is a two-day event. Uh, you see a picture of what it looks like. Um, we've been uh, offline, uh, distance format for the last two years, uh, but we'll be back uh, in 2022 live. It's typically in second week of May. Uh, we give tutorials uh, to uh, sponsor company representatives and also our students do presentations, uh, live presentations, and also lab tour where you can get to uh, look uh, intimately, uh, what does that dynamometer look like? Uh, what does that machine look like? What does the winding look like? Uh, what kind of heat sink are we using? Things like that. We have conversations with students, colleagues, and faculty. And typically, when sponsored company engineers come here, they go back with ideas on doing their job, on their job, doing their job better. That is what we've heard from our sponsors when they bring their engineers um, to come up with their colleagues here for two days. It's sort of like a retreat for them as well. And it helps uh, forge partnership with students. Hey, are you looking for a job? You know, where are you planning to relocate? Uh, West Coast, East Coast, stay in Wisconsin, uh, move south, look for warmer pastures or go up north to Appleton. Uh, Stevens Point, uh, wherever, Wausau, we're, we have a group of students you can talk to and, uh, and learn where their interests are, exchange cards, and today, obviously, they take their smartphone and swipe this way and that way, and uh, they're connected. And there's a technology transfer. We have continuing education opportunities. Professor Bull and Charlioli, you see in the picture, who's in the middle, uh, uh, in, the, in the group shot. Uh, he offers uh, about a dozen short courses every year, electromagnetic compatibility, electrical machine design, power electronics, boot camps. There are three, day, three or four day long short courses uh, offered by our faculty as well as sponsoring uh, uh, 
company uh, representatives as well as experts from the field that come here and teach. Obviously, it's a uh, distance program through offered through WebNow, but we'll come back live very soon. And we also offer MS uh, and PhD programs as well through distance education. That takes uh, uh, five to 10 years uh, for people who are working in companies with full-time jobs to get master's degree or PhD degree. We have uh, 15 to 20 students like that uh, on that. Obviously, we have student internships. Those are the best ways of doing technology transfer. We do directed research projects for companies. Faculty do consulting. And obviously, we also develop IP that is available for our sponsors. There is intellectual property provisions for sponsors. Their sponsorship fee is considered a pre uh, considered credit for royalty if they uh, choose to license any of the IP that's being developed. And our labs, we're very, very proud of what our students do. Power electronics labs, building hardware, testing hardware, or digital signal processing, analog circuit, digital circuits, laying out print circuit boards. Our students do all of that. Um, so they know what's involved. We have 6,000 square foot of lab space. Uh, with as safe as possible. Uh, our staff make sure that what our students work on, how they build, fall, they, there's no safety concern that we need to worry about. We've not had any ac uh, accidents in the past uh, 40 years of history in Medbec. Things have caught fire, but no accidents. Uh, and uh, there's a famous story uh, about myself. Uh, when I was a student uh, uh, in Wempec, I'm a graduate of this program as well. And it was probably a period um, 1991 or 92 on a review meeting. I had built this fancy 60 kilowatt inverter operating at 60 kilohertz in 1992. Even today, 60 kilohertz switching frequency inverter is a at 60 kilowatt is a push. But I had built something like that in 1992 with my advice from my advisor and staff and all those things. So I'm doing this demonstration wearing my nice suit and uh, proud as a PhD student. And I have about a half a dozen people uh, standing around me. I'm proudly talking about uh, uh, what I had built and boom, uh, there's an explosion halfway through my demonstration, and uh, the circuit is enclosed. As you see, we have plexiglass enclosures and other things, uh, but uh, we had an explosion. The cap capacitor exploded, and uh, we had stuff jumped up, and uh, that stuck to the ceiling. That's a story that I like to tell at, at times. So we have accidents because we're taking risks, uh, but we do it in a, a manner that we can manage the risks. And uh, we have capability to do uh, test capability up to 10,000 volts. And many places right now are working in uh, medium voltage uh, systems. And uh, we have capability for doing conduction emissions testing uh, for EMI from power converters. And uh, machine prototyping, this is our latest capability. We can build our own machine. Now, uh, here's an example of one of the machines uh, uh, prototype by our students. We can cut laminations. Uh, we have a stacked material, electrical steel, copper, aluminum, stainless steel uh, for building uh, machines. Lamination cutting, we have a laser cutter. We have coil winding equipment. On the left, you see a DC machine, a rotor of a DC machine that was built by our students. Uh, you see the commutator and the windings. And uh, uh, this is right now, we are doing this as independent study projects by students who are interested in learning how to build. Soon enough, we'll have actually a lab course that's built around uh, machine fabrication. That'll probably uh, one of a kind worldwide at a university lab to teach students in a lab how to build a machine at an undergraduate level and uh, uh, as an elective. 
We have test capabilities, dynamometers of various size, uh, medium scale dynamometers, high speed dynamometers, bench top dynamometers for doing a lot of machine testing. And we have also a bearingless dynamometer where uh, we can uh, um, levitate rotors and measure forces that are uh, um, experienced by rotors that are hanging in space by connecting to a load cell through measurement of reactant or reaction torques. This is actually built using a, C using a CNC mill that's not used for machining, but used as a drive for a dynamometer. And this is related to some of the work that uh, Professor Eric Severson is doing in the area of uh, magnetic levitation and magnetic bearings uh, and high-speed uh, machinery. Uh, this is our teaching lab. Um, and uh, we have uh, uh, places where we can actually um, seamlessly teach uh, using PowerPoint and other things, uh, demonstrate software, and then move to the hardware on the side uh, and dynamometer. So we can seamlessly move from software to hardware, do demonstrations, as well as student experiences uh, uh, in the space. We call that the teaching studio. And we're right now, this is the third generation of this lab, uh, first built in the 20s, uh, I'm sorry, 90s, and then uh, reorganized uh, and revamped about 15 years ago. And uh, we're in the process of uh, redesigning this right now again uh, to prepare ourselves for the next generation of uh, innovations to teach our students. And um, these are lab courses electric drives lab, uh, electric me mechanical power conversion lab, electric drive systems lab. We also have a power electronics lab and a drives and controls lab that's not listed on this slide. All of these are under uh, revision right now. Again, post COVID, it's an opportunity for us to rethink many of how we do things. So coming back, closing the loop, our legacy going back to President Van Huys, uh, he stated, we will not be content until the beneficent influence of this university reaches every home in our state. And as faculty members, as our students here, we strive to live up to this legacy every day. Um, today we would say, not every home in the state, we strive to reach everybody in the world because we're in the electrical energy business. And today the, with the emphasis on climate change, renewable energy, electric traction, energy efficiency, our discipline is more important than any place and various other campuses nationwide, worldwide are trying to tool themselves to do what we're doing. But we're 40 years ahead of time and we have a leg up and we continue to excel in what we do. And uh, so the takeaway I want you to think about is that our unwavering commitment to authenticity in education has been responsible for our continued success. Uh, we are, we don't, we're not satisfied with just teaching from a textbook and making the students problems at the end of the chapter and talking about another blackboard. We're interested in making sure the students can do what they learn. And that was the idea put forth by our president Van Huys more than a hundred years ago, because education cannot take place without connecting with the aspirations of the people. Education is the making of life. And that's what we live day in, day out. And I want to thank you for your time. And it is uh, just about eight o'clock. So we have about a half hour or so for questions. And I would love to answer questions either coming from chat and whatnot. So I will escape and stop this presentation. And back to you, Chuck or Scott, if you want to moderate. Uh, thank you very much. That was great.
Um, Tom, I think, is uh, watching the chat. I'm not sure there's... There, yeah, there's one question that actually San Rotter uh, entered um, first. And what he said um, uh, was, um, I wonder if you could say a few words about Bob Lorenz, who lived a couple of doors down uh, from San. So. Yes, uh, I would, uh, you know, I, I, I would, I could talk about Bob Lorenz for the entire one hour. And uh, uh, so in addition to the, our founding fathers, let's say Don Novotny or Tom Lippo, there had been sort of enormous amount of energy behind making this WEMPEC what it was. And one of them was Bob Lorenz, larger than life personality. Those of you, um, Sandy, you may have known him personally. If you saw him once, you'll never forget. And in fact, my journey to Wisconsin came from one of my family members, my brother, who was an engineer, who had come to visit Wisconsin to attend a short course taught by Professors John Novotny, Tom Lippo, and Bob Lorenz in 1985. And he was so impressed by what was going on here. And he told me, if you want to grow, I go to grad school. This is where you need to go. And so I would think about the energy behind WEMPEC to make it what it was beside the founders, Don and Bob uh, and, and Tom. Bob was a major energy. So they form, you know, you do, you, if you want to have a platform, you need three legs. Uh, the three of them made those three legs, and Bob and Tom and, uh, uh, and, and Don. And then on the top of it, when Don retired, we got Tom uh, Johns as well, who served as a fourth leg to give us the redundancy and make it like a table, I would say, as opposed to being a tripod. And now I'm here when, as a next generation, sort of trying to fill those shoes. And so Bob was a big energy behind uh, WEMPEC, particularly focused in the area of control of electric drives uh, and um, uh, major energy in terms of teaching, advising students, uh, connecting with industry, and being a spokesperson for WEMPEC worldwide. And he was one of the people, he has several dimensions in his life. And this was the dimension that we as students and faculty members in WEMPEC got to see. And um, just in retrospect, I should have probably put a slide that included Bob uh, and uh, Tom Johns as well, but uh, I, I, I should uh, you know, bite my tongue. And uh, I'm, I'm glad, to, as Sandy, you asked the question that I got at least a few minutes to talk about it. Another question was from Evandro. Uh, would you mind to, uh, mind to talk about industrial projects, uh, examples of partnerships and product development? Yes. Uh, Excellent thing, how do we work with uh, industry? And um, often um, one of the companies will make a phone call to me or one of our um, sponsor representatives or any of the faculty members and say, hey, you know what? We're struggling with this problem. We're trying to put a medium voltage drive for this particular application we're seeing a problem like this. Do you think you can dig into it? And we sort of think about it and say, all right, can this opportunity, this project, this uh, problem, does it have enough meat for a student to work on for a year or two of a master's project or three to four years for a PhD project? Can that mean lead to a meaningful contribution? For instance, let me give an example. Um, conducted EMI that is caused by a new generation of power devices, wide band gap power devices. Um, those are switching much faster. 
And there is a lot of literature out there. People are talking about it. And if we read the paper, we can't understand anything because everybody assumes that the problem has been solved because that paper says that they've solved the problem. When we try to put it in place, we understand that things that they haven't said and you read between the lines. So we define a project and we have deliverables. What would we do first year literature review? We may build a test bed, do some simulations and modeling, do some experiments. The student may go to your facility or sponsor's facility as an intern, work with your engineers to understand a little bit, come back here, work on it. But we are an academic institution. So when we make a contribution, we will publish that. But you get to see that the problem is solved and you get to see as the problem is solved, direct it so that it solves the problem as opposed to just getting a thesis at the end of it. And um, sometimes we partner with a company to go after a government grant. For instance, right now, electric transportation for airplanes is a big opportunity that everybody is trying to jump on. Um, so there are aerospace companies that can partner with one of our two faculty members. We get jointly <coughs> a million or two dollars shared between the company and the university sponsored by NASA or Department of Transportation uh, to work on a project. And that the government will ask, have a request for proposal. We try to meet those needs and uh, work together. So it varies in scope. I hope uh, that answers that question. And uh, for CEU, yes, our short courses, as well as our annual review meetings are all eligible for continuing education units. There's some paperwork to do. And I think there's maybe a nominal $20 fee or something to register that uh, experience as a continuing education credit and it can be arranged. So we have mechanisms for doing that. Uh, yeah, a uh, question about uh, VFD, HVAC used in a default mode, 100 page custom setting manuals. Can someone create and define the top custom settings used for using HVAC, perhaps other applications? Uh, I think this is a great area for us to work on. Um, and uh, there's a good amount of opportunity there to make that user interface friendly, um, be able to have, a, I would say, a mobile phone. You sort of dial like with a iPhone type of interface. You're swiping and swiping and having a graphical front end for doing that. That'll be an excellent project opportunity, Scott. Um, and uh, 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 we have to find, again, one of our faculty members willing to work with a sponsor to work on something like that. This may involve, I would say from today's perspective, one of the faculty members outside the core WEMPEC faculty, we can bring in a faculty member from sort of these machine learning data analytics type of place where they can take a graphic input and convert it into a bunch of numbers for programming. Uh, so there's an opportunity. Um, and uh, and one of the questions that came up uh, was actually just a comment from uh, Sharon uh, Kawani. Uh, she basically has a link to the tribute to uh, to uh, to Lorenz, uh, and I looked it up, and, and sure enough, it's a great great thing. Uh, you can click on that link if you want to uh, want to read more about Lorenz. Uh, uh, that was great. Yeah, it's in the chat window, and there's a similar link for Professor Tom Johns as well, who. Um, passed away, and some of you may have known him uh, about uh, um, more than a year ago. And uh, there's a similar link as well, um, commemorating uh, Professor Tom Johnson's uh, retirement. Uh, he's fortunately with us and continues to be very active in research. And um, uh, I would recommend, uh, if you're looking for a speaker for one of the evenings, uh, 
uh, he can be a great speaker to talk about not only about WEMPIC, but also other research areas in electric transportations, uh, IPM machines, and things like that. Um, there's a question from Chris about uh, intellectual property. Um, of things created by students working on projects funded by industry partners. Patents are owned by UW Madison or industry partners. There is an entire continuum there. The money that is supported by gift funds to support a student from that one third uh, is attributed when a student and a faculty member together make an invention. We disclose it to WARF, the Wisconsin Alumni Research Foundation. So they all own the license. All the WEMPIC sponsoring companies have an option for a non-exclusive license for which their sponsorship fees are covered as royalty credits. The royalty exceeds that payment that they've already made, they have to pay additional uh, royalty. But that is um, valid only for the invention made during the particular year where the company was a sponsor. When we have sponsored research projects, uh, joint research projects with companies working together with us, with the government agency like Department of Energy or NASA, there are specific terms that are uh, negotiated subject to the rules of what the government agency is and what the collaboration arrangement is. In terms of specific industry-sponsored research projects, it varies, non-exclusive, exclusive, within the field of use, and it depends on the negotiation between the company and if the students make the invention, it always belongs to the university and it's licensed on certain terms. If during the interaction, the invention is made by the company, the company owns the intellectual property. If it is done jointly, that means the student working with the company as part of the project, when sponsor, engineer, and the company, uh, and the student, jointly develop an invention and jointly owned. And then there are terms of how the joint invention, uh, typically it, that joint invention comes with its own royalty terms and exclusivity, non-exclusivity terms. Essentially, we, as a state agency, we want to follow the rules of the state. And if there are federal money involved, we want to follow the government rules. And there are always mechanisms to uh, figure out how to work together once you've built that goodwill and trust between the company and industry. So we've been in this business for 40 years and we continue to be successful because we respect confidentiality and ownership of intellectual property. I just want to make a comment that uh, during the summer of 2019, uh, Geary and the and Wempec and really the labs at the university host, hosted the, it was called the Future Energy Challenge, uh, where students from around the world were competing in the final stage of a bike, electric bike controller. And uh, it was a two day affair and it was really well run. I have to say that uh, uh, Geary did an excellent job in his organization for that. Well, I, 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 I could take credit, but uh, we couldn't have done that with the help, without the help from the IEEE Madison section, particularly Tom and Hugh, uh, the countless hours uh, that you put in um, during the days of the event and also run up to the event, uh, serving as volunteers. Uh, you know, we had teams from around the world, Asia, Europe, uh, and US uh, to participate in that. And uh, we really appreciated the par partnership we had with the IEEE Madison section and making that a success. Uh, and uh, it was a critical uh, period uh, or critical event we couldn't have done without you. I want to thank you again, Tom, for participating in it and also mentioning that here. And we're always uh, 
we always want to interact. Uh, I mean, obviously, all of us are busy people, and you all are busy people as well. And uh, often, we had to find time for us to work together, but we will find time to do our best uh, is what uh, we're right now. Um, as we speak, uh, we had conversations with our faculty to get our students more involved uh, in local chapter activities. And that is an initiative that uh, we'll be launching in the next couple of months. And uh, quite likely one of our faculty members will be in touch with, um, uh, with your leadership, Scott and Chuck and uh, Tom on, uh, on uh, um, taking that further. Uh, so we're looking for more partnership opportunities because we wanna do what we can better. There's another question uh, from Raj to everyone. Uh, have you looked at self-healing approach to applications of automatic fault detection, diagnosis, and system restoration, say involving several electric machinery as part of a large system? Absolutely, Raj. Thanks so much for that question. I was, in fact, having a conversation just this afternoon with one of our faculty members who works in computer networks and wireless networks, sensor networks area, on exactly trying to launch a project probably next fall with a student uh, to put a sensor network, wireless sensor networks. As we speak, I can show you uh, like sample hardware. This is a little microcontroller that comes with an antenna and the microcontroller can do a little bit of sensing work. And through the antenna that's attached to it, we can put hundreds of these uh, in a plant or somewhere where you're trying to do monitoring and get that information in, do some diagnostics. And if there's things that could, we can be done, we can do that. Uh, so we're hoping to launch a project in that area with a faculty member in the computer networks, obviously it involves um, um, amount of power, data rate, range, uh, data analytics. Uh, so this is prognostic and diagnostics in the power system. It's an area that's of interest to many of our sponsors. It has not been the core within the electric machines and power electronics area in the past, but it's becoming more so, and we're uh, preparing for that. Chuck, it sounds like we're wrapping up. Yeah, it looks that way. Um, I guess I uh, remind everybody that we did record the the, um, the meeting, and and I guess we've uh, probably have um, captioning recorded uh, separately. Um, I don't. It probably won't be synced, although. I don't know how that all works. Um, it will be, um, I, I think that um, uh, Gary and Kyle uh, may re re review it um, and then we'll post it on IEEE TV and um, section four um, uh, YouTube. And then and uh, Gary will also be putting the link. Once we get the video up, uh, uh, there'll be a link to that on the um, WEMPEC website as well. Um, and another, uh, I guess, Sam uh, asked another question. Yes, are you working with the Professor Bona Krishnaswamy? Exactly, you were right. Uh, Sandy, I, I had a meeting with her in my office uh, at 2 p.m. today, just talking about this and uh, some of the technologies that their students have and uh, how we can uh, partner together on that. So it looks like uh, you're able to do a extrasensory perception. I should watch uh, if you have, if my office is bugged or whatnot. <laughs> uh, thanks for that uh, uh, question and you guessed it right. Oh, I, I've been working with her, so I tell her that uh, if she has any more questions, I'd be happy to try and answer them. 
Absolutely, absolutely. Thanks so much, Sandy. Sen or Sandy, can you also um, uh, tell a little bit about your background so that everybody else can know uh, uh, about your background and your perspectives that can help us uh, frame? Well, I hope I don't get too emotional. I mean, Bob just lived up the street, and he uh, encouraged me to write a paper for a, a drive. Uh, a conference here in Madison. It was uh, when I was working with Motorola on electric power steering. And uh, it's probably the more academic paper that I've written. Other papers have been in life cycle assessment and, and uh, trying to uh, teach about um, energy. And that's why I, I asked you the question earlier about um, that uh, wind turbines are not scalable like photovoltaics. And yeah. I don't know, I have a bug uh, about the kid wind about that. that uh, as a young person, sometimes you can get the wrong idea too easily and it's very hard to do the science storytelling. And uh, so maybe that's, that's what I've been getting into, but I, I did do a, design a few electric drives, but uh, veered from that into uh, working at Motorola and uh, designing hearing aids. But but uh, Bob certainly, uh, he was a very uh, big uh, influence on my life and I greatly miss him. Yeah, yeah, thanks for sharing that. And um, uh, one of the things um, um, uh, in, 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 that, in that context, in the wind uh, context is that uh, one of the projects uh, that I was sort of very passionate about about 15 years or so ago was um, uh, getting our students to build a wind turbine and um, sort of involves um, carving the blades, building the turbine, building the electric generator, and uh, putting the tower, pouring concrete, uh, integrating civil and mechanical and electrical and the electronic domains uh, together, uh, sort of like a 100, 200 watt rated turbine. We built about a half a dozen of them uh, and installed it in a few plop parts and a couple of them in the Madison area as well. But we were not able to sustain that uh, from a perspective of um, educational infrastructure and things like that. But I'm glad that you brought up how solar scales uh, and I think the approach we're taking now, I ran a pilot this summer using a little uh, fairly small solar system uh, for students to put together a, a, a system that is uh, that can help them learn about the principles, but at a reasonable cost, and also give them an authentic experience on that. And where we're going is that, uh, I mean, those of you who are in Madison, you probably have seen these little free libraries. And we're thinking about putting a small solar roof on it and a small battery in there and some intelligence in there to be able to, for people to charge their uh, cell phones or other things uh, when they're on the road, when they're not at home. Uh, so that's sort of a, a retrofit type of idea we're coming up with for little free libraries. And, uh, and uh, so that's a, 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 an avenue we're focusing on to reaching out to younger people, general public about uh, learn about power electronics and energy and other things. Uh, thank you. And I'm using that opportunity to um, say a few more things about what we're up to. And uh, I've also uh, put my email address in the chat window. And And um, so you can also use that address. If you go to wempecwisc.edu, you'll find my contact information there as well. Um, yeah. So are we ready to wrap it up then? Well, thank everybody. Thank you everybody for participating. We've got a pretty good level of participation in this meeting. Um, and uh, hope to see you again soon. Thank you all. Thank good you. night and happy holidays.
Thank you all. Good night.